Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to a series of panels on sort of one of the bolder promises of fintech, which is cryptocurrency and sort of decentralized financial services. I thought it would be kind of fun at the top if um, everyone could get their phones out. We'll kind of see who uh, the crypto optimists and pessimists are amongst us. So um, our first question is going to be, how do you see crypto assets evolving in the next two to five years? Steady rise? Uh, B, slow decline, C, all the way to the moon, I know there will be some of you, or D, all the way to zero. Well, they're the moon people, okay, good showing. All right, quite a bit of optimism. I think we've seen a lot of that sentiment lately in some of the news. Very interesting, That's not, too many, not too many zeros down there. All right, so we'll move on to the second question. How long do you think crypto assets are going to stick around? Do they have less than a year before they're gone? One to five years? Or do we think that you know, these things are here to stay, see, five years and beyond? Wow. OK, I guess they've been around for a decade, so might as well take the long bet there. We got one person who thinks the collapse is coming in 2019. <laughs> All right. And the third question is, do crypto assets threaten sovereign currency? Yes or no? Are these things a threat to governments? Threat to government. OK. Even divide. All right. Wow, that's, that's quite an even breakdown. That's very interesting. So we'll, we'll get to hear a little bit from a former member of a, of a government later today um, when we get a regulator's perspective. But first, I'd just like to kind of frame the conversation we're going to have with sort of four key challenges that regulators are likely to face as they start thinking about how to deal with crypto assets. So the first sort of obvious problem for regulators is, is the question of geography. Um, what you're seeing here is a, a heat map of the Bitcoin network. Um, there are about 10,000 full nodes of Bitcoin, right? That's computers that have a, a full copy of the ledger. Um, they're, they're, they're accepting transaction messages and they're verifying that um, all the transactions are following all of the rules. And you see here that these nodes are pretty widely dispersed. It's mostly an American and a Western European phenomenon, um, but you'll see that it's pretty much global. It's borderless, except where there are internet controls. Um, and so sort of... The idea of Bitcoin, I think the analogy that I find most apt is, is money over internet protocol, right? So AT&T used to get most of its revenue from long distance telephony. And you know, by the 90s, that was declining 20% year over year. And now the internet um, basically handles all di long distance telephony. So sort of some things that are surprising about this, right? China appears bright green, as though there's a lot of activity taking place there, even though I think everyone's heard that China's pretty much clamped down on citizens' access to cryptocurrency exchanges. Well, so a lot of that activity is in Hong Kong, which China obviously doesn't control quite as strictly as uh, mainland citizens. Um, it's also kind of interesting to, to, to understand that a lot of the technological development is taking place in China, and a lot of the evidence suggests that Chinese consumers still have a lot of demand for crypto assets. Um, they're probably denominated in, in US dollars. So if, if this kind of dispersed network of regulators are going to come together and, and deal with this problem, right, it's going to take G20-level cooperation. Uh, that's something that we really haven't seen in financial services since 2008 and the financial crisis. In, in 2018, we've seen about $600 billion in market cap kind of disappear overnight. No one is, is really all that concerned. So we're probably a long way off from uh, a global coordination to deal with a problem as sort of disperses this. So it's kind of the second question that regulators are going to be thinking about is the resilience of the network, right? If people are putting a lot of their money um, into this system that no one controls and no one can check on, well, they want to know that it is safe and that it's going to perpetuate into the future. So kind of Bitcoin is, is self-funding, right? All the people that are mining Bitcoin, they expect to get Bitcoin in return for running the network. And it's not a lot different from the US Federal Reserve, which is also self-funding. So what we're seeing here is that miners are kind of behind the price curve, right? This white line is a collapse in their revenue as transaction volumes trailed off. 
but the, the blue bars indicate that they just kept spending money buying computers to add to the network. Um, and that's part of the competitive aspect of, of, of the Bitcoin blockchain, right, is that the people who own the most computing power end up reaping the most rewards. So now we've started to see that decline a little bit, and that kind of brings up the question of, will there be enough decentralization, or will a couple people gain control of this network and start to threaten it? Bitmain, which is a manufacturer of kind of these computing chips that run a lot of the activity on the network, they control you know, almost 50% of the network now through the various mining pools that they're um, sort of in charge of, and that's kind of a threat to network security. Um, so the, a third question that regulators are going to be thinking about in D.C. are, are where retail and systemic risks arrive, arise in this technology. So what we see here is sort of the image of Bitcoin leverage. The blue line is all the dollar volume transactions of Bitcoins that are taking place at um, virtual currency marketplaces. But the white line, that indicates actual Bitcoins that are being sent to and from participants on the network. So you can see that the exchanges are generating leverage. This is sort of what the picture of OTC derivatives look like from 1998 to 2008. There was a sort of a set amount of notional financial claims and built atop that was a, um, a gigantic sort of house of cards. So a lot of this leverage is, is, is coming from sort of ex-US exchanges that are sort of doing some manipulative things and there's some wash trading um, and there's sort of probably an effort to support the price level a bit abroad. For the most part, the US exchanges are more transparent and more reliable. So this is sort of a, mostly an issue for regulators abroad to be concerned about. And sort of kind of a fourth thing is that uh, regulators need a way to judge value, right? So the Fed, when they're setting monetary policy, they're always worried about um, sort of where the direction of inflation is going, and they have a lot of really good fundamental indicators that they can follow. A regulator that's looking at systemic risk, like any investor, really has no way of knowing, hey, is this particular asset overvalued? Is there a risk here? Are there a lot of uh, sort of irrational exuberance taking place in this market? And do we need to do more or do we let this market just sort of perpetuate? So this is kind of an interesting um, first attempt at comparing across crypto assets. This is the Bitcoin network's um, net uh, value to transaction ratio. So this is taking the value of all the Bitcoin that are on the blockchain that are being transacted, and it's dividing it by the dollar volume of all the transactions that are taking place between participants. So there's sort of a, there's a fundamental economic value to Bitcoin, which is that it can transfer wealth amongst people without using the established financial services system. That's a, a core revenue generator of banks. Um, and so this kind of shows you that as the price in the past has peaked, this is, by the way, on a logarithmic scale, which just sort of um, shrinks some of the outlying prices. You'll see that the NVT rose above the price level, and we're kind of getting back to a, to a similar point now. And interestingly, that's not because the price is so high, right? The price is still way below its uh, 2017 peak, but the transaction volume has declined precipitously on the Bitcoin blockchain. So this is kind of a way that regulators might start to look for data to really think about this problem that they're confronted with and kind of how to start thinking about solutions. So to kind of get this regulatory perspective, um, we're going to turn to our guest, a longtime securities lawyer. She's currently with the Seneca Women Group, um, former CFTC Commissioner Sharon Bowen. Please help me welcome her to the stage. Thanks for joining us. You did all the hard work. <laughs> all right, so to start, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing since you left the CFTC? Well, I've had the good fortune to be able to combine my expertise and passion with the financial markets with also my long-term passion for diversity and inclusion. I currently serve on the board of the Intercontinental Exchange which is a public company, as you know. Um, they're a global provider of uh, one of the largest global exchanges and clearing houses in the world. We also provide data services and listing services. 
I happen to be also in the boards of their two affiliate companies, the New York Stock Exchange and the Chicago Stock Exchange. The fun stuff that I do is being connected with cynical women. And that's named after Cynical Falls, New York. And I say that often because for whatever reason, when I say Seneca women to men, they think I'm seeing cynical women. <laughs> um, and, and maybe it's just a reflection of the times right now, but we're, but we're, you know, we're far from that. Um, Seneca women was created by Ambassador Milan Bavir and Kim Azzarelli. Um, they've done a great job of, of building a superb uh, thought leadership content uh, provision for companies. So they do corporate advisory works for Fortune 100 companies and other corporations. Uh, they help to connect women leaders and advance the, the goals and causes of women and girls. Uh, most importantly, we have recently worked with Apple and created a SaaS platform. And it's really been created to help companies build a positive culture. Um, it's there to help women advance their careers. And it's also useful in helping millennials be engaged and connected with the companies and each other. But I think one of the most dynamic parts about this as well is that the data analytics really allows companies to take a pulse of the organization and to be flexible in affecting a positive change in culture. And I also think it's you know, highly scalable for many other uses as well. So yes. it's a fun project. So it's obviously very important that we have more women in tech. And as kind of part of that, I'm sure you've been thinking a lot about these tech issues. Um, including cryptocurrencies, which you really can't get away from. They're in the news every day. Um, so just tell us a little bit about how concerned, you know, the regulatory community is about cryptocurrencies and kind of what they were doing um, right as you departed last year. Yes. Uh, very concerned, obviously. Um, every regulator across the globe, uh, and I've had the privilege of meeting with regulators from, you know, the EU, from Hong Kong, from Africa, um, from all over the world, and everyone is thinking about it and rightly so. Um, and I think um, the responses really vary, but I think there's a major theme um, when re regulators look at this. You know, one, they wanna make sure that their monetary supply and their currencies are not harmed, you know, by these virtual currencies. Two, they always wanna protect their investors from fraud and manipulation. And three, they wanna embrace innovation and technology um, no one wants to be in the way of sort of stopping the next internet, but at the same time, it's the right balance of embracing innovation but protecting. Right, and Commissioner Giancarlo, or Chairman Giancarlo, has been really sort of innovation, uh, pro-innovation. He's had a light touch. Uh, do you think that that's likely to persist, and do you think that's a good strategy? So one of the things that was happening just as I left the agency, we launched the CFTC lab, and the whole point was to learn about uh, the technology and to share any regulatory concerns we would have. Um, I, I think that's the right approach, um, frankly. Um, it's a lot better to um, know what, what it is that you're dealing with rather than waiting for the next crisis um, to, to then try to tackle the problem. So I think being ahead of the game and being involved really, really makes sense. The, you know, the light touch approach is not necessarily the, the way that the Treasury and the Fed have looked at it. Right. Um, you know, on the other hand, I, I don't think that the Fed sees cryptocurrencies as you know, being a, a, a threat or a systemic risk, um, if you will. Um, I, I think the current administration and Treasury, they're very um, accommodative to innovation and are asking for you know, greater cooperation and collaboration. So let's come back to systemic risk in a, in a moment. But for right now, it seems like most of the regulatory effort is focused on enforcement. Do you see that as sort of um, a CFTC first priority, or do you see that as sort of mostly lying with FinCEN and OFAC at the Treasury? So, you know, I think in protecting our investors is, is definitely the paramount concern of, of all regulators. And so I, the fact that you're seeing increased enforcement action both at the SEC le level with ICOs and at the CFTC. So as you know, uh, virtual currencies are commodities. Right. Uh, but you know, notwithstanding that, there is a statutory gap. Uh, we don't really have uh, oversight of the cash market, uh, the underlying Bitcoin cash market. And so there is a statutory gap there. 
And so, I, but I think it's wise for regulators to look at the enforcement. Um, they've made investments in making sure that consumers are aware of the risk. So there's a lot of investor education, which I, frankly, I think that's always the first and best line of defense is to educate the public right. you know, against the risk of these currencies. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the CFTC is trying to set up some surveillance agreements with some of these marketplaces to get sort of a view into some of this deceptive and manipulative trading that might be going on at some of these uh, exchanges? Probably in the U.S. it's, it's less of an issue, um, but is that a priority at the CFTC? And how do you see that expanding in the future? Yeah, it's always a priority. And, we, we, you know, surveillance is an important part of what we do in our market. And, but with that, you need the technology to do it with that. You need obviously the resources. Right. Um, to do it. I've always been amazed at how much was accomplished at the agency with you know, the few amount of funds that, that we actually got. It's got about 700 full-time employees? About 700, exactly. So it's I mean, kind of a small group with a, just a big remit to cover? A really big remit. Right. And you know, constantly in, in all my speeches, I would point to the fact that you know, our budget at that point was flat funded at about $240 million to regulate a $400 trillion uh, swaps market. Right. Uh, you did the math. <laughs> so let's let's talk a little bit about systemic risk. We've seen kind of increasingly that banks, institutional investors are interested in this um, this technology. Um, sort of how big do you think it has to get before there's concern about systemic risk? And then um, sort of right now, do you think anyone is sort of laying the groundwork in the government to kind of monitor for that kind of an increase in risk? Absolutely, everyone is definitely monitoring. I mean, you may not read it in the, in the headlines that much, but it kind of put it in perspective and, and you know, why, you know, for example, the Fed doesn't kind of see systemic risk in, um, in the marketplace. You know, I think the transaction volume for Bitcoin was around 490,000 or so at the end of last year. Compare that to Visa that has 65,000 transaction messages right. per second. Um, so we've got a long ways to go, I think, before we have to really worry about systemic risk. Um, so we lost about $600 billion in crypto market cap, right? But sort of the takeaway from that is maybe that maybe these aren't the retail investors that are sort of the core of the mission. Maybe these are sort of um, international people. Maybe this wasn't a big U.S. loss. And what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think transparency has a, a great effect in, in making this be a reality, um, to be honest with you. So I think when... Um, you know, the CFTC allowed CME and CBO to, to certify Bitcoin futures. Um, I knew the minute that happened, we had some transparency in the marketplace. By definition, it means you're going to have uh, prices go down and some, hopefully some, some competition. I think the fact that you've got every major bank, hedge fund, insurance company, retail company focused on this also says a lot. And, and you know, no doubt some of that money that fled the market um, was money that shouldn't have been there. I mean, it's one of the reasons why we haven't had institutional investors really embrace um, you know, crypto as, as, a, as a valid um, uh, transaction payment um, because so, of the instability and not knowing. Right. So the futures are a really interesting sort of product development because those can be held on a bank balance sheet, right? Um, and that can kind of sort of lead up to a buildup of risk, and, and there's um, a concern that clearinghouses might need to maintain more liquidity if there's another gigantic sort of price fall. Um, do you think that banks will be able to hold crypto assets on their balance sheet anytime soon, or is that just going to be a strong no? Well, I think a couple, couple of things. So I think, you know, when you're talking about um, so the marketplace, it means that more margin will be held um, for those types of assets. Um, the, the fact that banks um, are subject to capital rules and stress tests, you know, you hear statements that, um, you know, banks may be required to keep as much as 1,250% dollar for dollar capital for each crypto asset. And so you have to take into account the liquidity that's there. So no, no bank is going to want to set aside if they're allowed to, frankly, and some banks can't, um, to set aside dollar for dollar cash at 1,250%, the whole a highly illiquid asset. Um, so I think the short answer is, is no. Okay, so we're probably safe for now, right? <laughs> Maybe that risk might build up in the future. So you kind of mentioned this. Is there a statutory gap? 
Um, what do you think is kind of the single most effective thing that lawmakers could do to bring this into sort of a more regulated space? And do you think that'll happen soon? I think that's starting to happen. Um, we do know we have applications to, to have you know, regulated, transparent exchanges. Um, and that's important. And I think that's sort of the, the very first step, if you will. Um, you know, confidence and trust are the two main ingredients to a healthy, vibrant financial ecosystem. And once, you know, that is the case, you know, whether you're looking at protection from hacking, um, and transparency as to who's on the side of the trade, you know, until that happens, um, I, I don't think we'll have a really vibrant market. I think the institutional investors will be a little bit leery. But, you know, notwithstanding that, we know that Fidelity announced, I think, right. in the last day or so, that they will be trading in store in Bitcoin for their hedge funds and institutional investors. Um, you know, we know that exchanges, crypto exchanges, are moving to places like Dublin and other places across the globe um, as well. So it, it's definitely got legs. It's got, I think, you know, growing legs, if you will. Yeah, so we asked the audience. The audience kind of agrees with you there. Uh, it looks like we're sort of on a slow growth path. This is going to stick around for a while. It seems like we're relying in the U.S. on the CFTC to protect us. And, you know, we all know that sort of their budget is very constrained for kind of what they've been given after Dodd-Frank. So kind of what are your thoughts on the budget? And, you know, what do you think that the biggest sort of challenge is going to be for the CFTC moving forward? Right. And, and you know, as I kind of alluded to, the, the, you know, the resource constraint is, 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 is for real. But you know, notwithstanding that, I think dollars are being well placed, you know, where the risk is, which is why you see the enforcement actions um, being so, so aggressive. And I, I think so that's really uh, the right approach. You know, I think the jury's still out. Um, you know, frankly, I'm optimistic um, in, in terms of, you know, where I see this heading. Um, but I, as always, I think, you know, transparency is always the, the, the solution um, to a vibrant market. And so you think probably the CFTC bringing that actually kind of helps the asset class grow in the future? Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that that's going to be all of our time for today. Thank you so much, Commissioner Bowen. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.